Hello, everyone. Welcome today to our webinar. It is the first webinar of a series of four we're going to be doing this year with the ontology's community practice. Um, today, we're going to be talking about what makes an ontology a reference for data annotation. I'm going to hand it over now to Elizabeth Arnault, who leads the ontology's community of practice and is a scientist at Biodiversity International here in Montpellier. Thank you, Aman, for, for the introduction. So welcome to all the participants to this webinar. Uh, this, as Aman said, this is the first of a series, so we are very happy to see a great attendance of around 40 people connected now. And uh, I just wanted to remind quickly uh, what is an ontology. Ontology, in fact, uh, for non-experts, is a formal logical representation of a domain of knowledge where key concept, concepts are defined, as well as the relationships that exist between those concepts. So an ontology provides a shared vocabulary for a domain, a textual definition of the term in vocabularies, standard identifiers for each concept, machine-readable axioms and definitions that enable computational access. And an ontology can facilitate data publication access and analysis. For information, I just put a link to a presentation of Marie-Angélique Laporte, who is uh, our ontology uh, engineer at Biodiversity International, where you can find more information. So, how do we use uh, the semantics for data in agriculture, particularly for CGIR, um, and in interest to the big data platform? For us, the main challenge is uh, to, to face the demand from the digitalization of agriculture, particularly for the data management cycle, from data collect, data storage and access, data analysis for models or statistics, and also data access and information access for our stakeholders, um, our end users being the farmers. So this... Um, multidisciplinary uh, data cycle needs an agreed terminology that clearly defines the meaning of the item carrying the information along this data management cycle. And the ontology terminology should support the data integration and interpretation, integration across multidisciplinary domain and interpretation across uh, different stakeholders. So, um, the ontology is also used for sharing a common understanding of the structure of information among not only the people, but also the software agents. The community of practice of the big data has been identified as a key community for identifying and recommending reference ontologies for each knowledge domain or science domain that uh, supports uh, research in agriculture. So in that context, and because the community of practice has ranked uh, quite high the topic about what makes an ontology a reference for our tools, for our data annotation, we decided to start by this question. Thank you, Aman. Thank you, Elizabeth. Now we'll move on to the panelists. Um, we have a great group with us, four panelists today that will be speaking with us. Um, here they are, you probably saw them also on the invitation. Uh, we'd like to thank you, all of you, for your time and preparing for today. And we're going to start off with the first panelist, Panka Jaswal, from Oregon State University, representing the Plantium Project. Pankaj? Hello. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm at uh, Oregon State University, and I'm representing the Plantium Project, which is uh, a project funded by NSF, and it's an international one with its collaborating partners from the University of Birmingham, the Biodiversity International, uh, the Lawrence Berkeley Institute, uh, and uh, we have uh, the New York Botanical Garden. Uh, and that's how uh, we try to build a collaborative community which is cross-disciplinary in terms of bioinformatics and uh, plant biologists and plant breeders, and you can imagine the domain experts coming in together to create ontologies. Uh, what, uh, essentially what happens is, in general, what we are looking at is how we create a set of ontologies that are applicable across the plant biology. And that includes your uh, anything that you do it in the domains of genomics, genetics, crop improvement, 
plant breeding and germplasm management and uh, moving on to much more detail the molecular analysis in, in terms of molecular biology proteomics and all sorts of omics that we do so it's a big domain area that we generally cover we would love to see how uh, how these reference anthologies can help mitigate the pro uh, problem of diversity of the data sets but bring together uh, uh, data uh, and connect all the data uh, by by using the similar or same common vocabulary or reference vocabularies. So I was given two questions, and the first one is, what makes an ontology reference for data annotation? So this, what I'm presenting you is the Plantium Project's uh, perspective. Uh, since we are heavily involved in building the reference for plants and crops in general, we do not build all the kinds of ontologies. We to work with a lot of collaborative projects such as gene ontology, and the CABI, the ENVO uh, that you would be going to be hearing a little bit more about. But we also have our domains in terms of uh, plant uh, anatomy, for example, and the plant growth stages, uh, the plant phenotypes, that's the traits uh, that people are measuring. Uh, and the kind of experimental conditions that the people are uh, are also recording as part of their metadata uh, data collection. So these are the kinds of reference ontology domains that we do present, uh, we develop, uh, we revise, and we continue to maintain them uh, for the community. And they are mainly species agnostic in the sense that they they refer to a broader community of uh, uh, of uh, and representing uh, the domain area that cuts across the uh, green plant tree of life uh, we are looking at. So here are some of our perspectives that we have to bring in and we have learned from our own experiences because everybody starts somewhere and, and the whole idea is to uh, work collaboratively with people who are already working on the ontology domain itself. So very first one is adhere to the OBO Foundry guidelines uh, on design and format. And o it's OBO is Open Biomedical Ontologies and plants are part of that bio concept in that. Uh, and you're going to be hearing a little bit more about it uh, from the subsequent uh, presentations. Uh, also is to represent a unique non-overlapping knowledge domain. So as you can see from your right hand side, it's either phenotype growth, uh, growth stages or plant structures or plant stresses, which includes diseases or biochemical entities or molecular function. These are all non-overlapping concepts. So each, uh, each root of the individual ontology that you're seeing on your right hand side just represents that and and what we try to do is let's say if some function is associated with a phenotype we build relationships between the two orthogonal ontologies rather than recreating the terms that uh, in in our own ontologies it's it's a much more collaborative aspect and it's you can call it as a network of ontologies rather than just a single ontology that we are looking at in terms of a reference uh, and that is also the beauty and robustness of that ontology is. Uh, next one is uh, represent an accurate science supported by evidences. So that's why it is, the whole idea is to have a collaborative team where you have bioinformatics analysts, you have ontologists, you have uh, language experts, you have uh, knowledge or bi biologists, the plant breeders, uh, the plant anatomists, and depending on which ontology you're working on, you bring together a team and try to gather how their perceptions and consensions and learning skills are, and then you try to build a, a model of an ontology uh, from that side. Uh, biggest one is open source or uh, CC by license so that anybody can find you under the fair data principles aspects, but Binding is one thing, but is it open for using it uh, and can be used by anybody unless that clause opens it says that you can anybody can use it uh, as long as you are not disturbing uh, the whole structure itself. You cannot edit until you have the editing rights on that ontology and you don't want the, everybody to be editing. You want a global 
consortium of cats, uh, of people who are tightly knit and have been trained in the ontology engineering aspects. They, are, they know how to do it. Uh, but you work with the community on that side to take the feedback. But uh, everybody's allowed to collaborate and contribute uh, and to the growth and refinement of that ontology. And that, and, but uh, so that's where open source, PC by and should be fair. Uh, it should be my, widely used in annotation and data capture means uh, your, uh, is your ontology that you're developing is being used in a popular sense, is being used by many resources. If it's only used by one single resource, then it makes no sense. Uh, or rather what you can call it as this is a localized effort. Uh, how is it going to help uh, the other communities? Uh, can they harp on to the same concepts or can they use the same ontology for their own purposes? So you need to be very careful on uh, how what uh, what's the breadth of that and and can it help in annotation uh, preferably from the plantium perspective uh, all the reference anthologies that we host are species agnostic means they do not represent a single in species concept unless it's absolutely required and occurs only in that species and nowhere else uh, otherwise we try all our best to stay generic uh, so, for example, you can call a plant and in the plant anatomy, you would have an even fluorescence as a, as, as a regular reference term, but it will carry uh, some instances and uh, some references as synonyms to spike, uh, to ear, to grassl, and uh, all sorts of panicle, for example, uh, and rosette. Uh, so these are kinds of things that you would start seeing uh, in the ontology. So how we bring together an engineer and an ontology that is catering to uh, a bigger uh, demand. Then comes the commitment to active development and evolution for a very long, long time. It should not go stagnant for a, for, for a moment. You can imagine each, almost any of these ontologies are going uh, anywhere between 5 to 10, 15, 20, uh, or even more uh, edits every day. So you have every every couple of hours, you will have a new version of the ontology uh, that are coming in. Although you're not expected to use all each and every version, but uh, a one stable version is released uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a, their rep respective release cycles whenever they have to be used. And the answer is it must be designed to answer both the computing and the community need. Can it answer the questions that you're trying to get out of this uh, ontology that we have? And then the biggest one is uh, you don't want the, uh, the edits to be, to be scattered around. People from all over the world are, uh, are preferably chosen and trained to work on those ontologies off-site. So they, they all have editing rights, but you maintain a one single site where all the editing is recorded and all the versions are recorded uh, so that you have a single site of distribution. Uh, in the first place. That is your primary source and everybody contributes uh, on that side. So whole idea is uh, the three R's. The, you have to you should be reusing, revising, and recycling the same ontology, but try not to reinvent the whole wheel that we, uh, that somebody has already put in into that effort. Uh, so for example, I don't want to reinvent the molecular function uh, aspects of the gene ontology. They are very good. And if you find that those things are deficient in some things, then you ask them to add those concepts or you basically ask them to uh, refine based on the new knowledge that you might bring in onto the table. Uh, you need to be doing the development and revisions and they're all community driven by collaborative effort. As I said, it should be maintaining a single source sign, but also you, before you start building an ontology, uh, People have to survey the community, what are the questions that they're trying to answer. And if you have a good robust data to annotate in the first place, because you want to annotate first and test whether your ontology is robust enough to give you an answer for that. It's not just about annotating, it's about can you get the answers out of it as well. And that's where your bio, the sale pitch is in terms of can biologists use this data set to answer their respective uh, difficult questions that we have. Again, building consensus in the community, which is very difficult, and but it comes with by showing the significance, and if you can show the applications, that yes, it can answer your questions.
uh, clearly define the role, whether it is at a global level or it's a local or a community uh, level. That will define whether it's a reference ontology or it's an application ontology for you. Uh, always seek help. Don't work in isolation. That is, that is the thing that we have learned uh, is um, be receptive uh, always. Uh, uh, there will be uh, the many of the ontologies do come with a lot of criticism in the beginning, but as they mature and the people developing them learn, uh, they become a very high quality ontology for that purpose. And then uh, keep them open from uh, beginning, uh, right from uh, as soon as you start the concept, so that people can see that you exist and you are visible to the community and your ontology is visible. The ontologies can continue to evolve. But if then you know that you are present in that domain area, then that is the perfect way. Because otherwise, people don't know if you're working in isolation and then you get into hiding and then people start reinventing, oh, this concept is missing and I'm working on it. But then all of, all of a sudden you realize, oh, somebody has already worked on it. So you don't want to be in that situation. So build a team and publish your peer review, uh, peer publish your ontologies in the peer review journals. Uh, that is our uh, take home message from the Plantion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pankaj. Now we're going to move to Pierre-Louis-Gy Boutki from Alfred Wegener Institute. Hi, everybody. I'm going to give another perspective. Um, it overlaps very much with what Pankaj has said. Indeed, we develop in the same sort of community, the SOPO Foundry and Library. So there's naturally some overlap in the recommendations. Um, my perspective comes from the environmental semantics with the ENVO project and the sustainable development goals or semantics for sustainability from the SDGIO perspective. It's an ontology we develop in collaboration with UN Environment to bridge um, institutional objectives to the SDG agenda and make sure that uh, things are on the map. Um, there's an emerging UN semantic interoperability framework, which we are plugged into, and we'd like to then connect new and emerging ontologies into that system. So we can move on. We can, okay, great. So again, um, as Elizabeth said, I'm going to be talking about ontologies specifically here um, in the sense that they are high, highly expressive entities. They're knowledge graphs that machines can understand and can reason over, um, as opposed to things like glossaries, the sori, and vocabularies, which are very useful in themselves and, in fact, can cover a much more ground than ontologies because you don't have to develop them at such fine grain, um, but really we're focusing on ontologies in this conversation. Um, again, I'd just like to rem remind, so remind people that the I in FAIR is about interoperability, and the subpoints of that I um, specify that you need these sort of formal, accessible, and applicable languages for knowledge representation. A little bit of context, those ontologies that are very expressive, they come from that branch of artificial intelligence known as knowledge representation, and indeed they follow formal logics. Um, so this is what is satisfying that I and FAIR. You can do quite a lot of the I and FAIR with vocabularies and thesauri, but um, to really bring the machines closer to human knowledge, you do indeed need it, something more fun. Things that I would look for when I'm looking at a new ontology that's supposed to be a reference ontology. Um, an ontology, it's important to realize that an ontology itself is not a standard. Not always, sometimes it is. But an ontology is a representation of potentially many standards, which can be com community or official standards let's say like the SDGs, or which are ratified by the General Assembly, or the WWF Biomes, in our case in ENVO, which is um, ratified by the WWF or researched by them. We simply express it. We are not in charge of that standard, but we provide an interface to it. So that's what I look for, that reference ontologies are also expressing other kinds of references in their content. And they're expressing this using standard W3C compliant languages like OWL, so they're not doing anything too exotic um, so that anyone can know how to work with them if they know uh, how to work with those languages, which again are quite generalized. It's important that they are then um, they are it's important that they are then also checked for their logical consistency. So diagnostic checks are very important, that the ontologies themselves check that all of their logical axioms check out and there are no conflicts, that therefore the machines will understand what's going on. Of course, engaging lots of people, as, as Pankaj said also. Um, you need lots of eyes on this to make sure that the knowledge is representative of the field and also that, that other views are um, different views, different, uh, different opinions, as long as they're backed up by some sort of science, are also present. And that's on to the next point, that the ontology itself should be agnostic if it's a reference ontology. It's agnostic to who is correct about something. An example that we have in Enfo frequently is forest, 
there are over a thousand definitions, official definitions of what a forest is, and we cannot say which one is correct. There are national um, jurisdictions that have reasons for that. So we have to be agnostic, express them, but also make it clear to the machine why they're different. Um, of course, there should be a, a way to change, uh, to deal with changing content, such that the machine will know what's been obsoleted and can replace that without human intervention. The most, uh, the key point there uh, at the end is that it inter, it really interoperates. If this is supposed to be an interoperability solution, the ontology itself should have proven interoperability with other ontologies and some cross references to other vocabulary. Um, again, as Punker said also that, and I, I certainly agree that these reference ontologies, they have to survive funding cycles. It can't be about one project. There have to be people from multiple projects that use it and maintain it such that um, it can survive in the long term. It's just a, that's just a, a note. And of course, in order to do that, it needs to follow some sort of recipe for development that other people can work with too. This is again, why we develop within the Oboe Foundry and Library. Um, because there is a common way of doing things so that if somebody stops editing for whatever reason, other people can catch up and, and maintain that ontology for the future. And then just in closing, this is some of the, some of the, uh, just a schematic illustration of what we're up to when we're developing semantics in our field. We bridge, we bridge things like SDGIO for uh, mapping our science to sustainable development goals. We use KEBI for chemicals, uh, emerging ontologies like agro, the agronomy ontology, and food on for food and agriculture and agronomy. Um, ontologies like the environment ontology, the populations and community ontology, the ecological core ontology for environmental entities, landscapes, ecosystems, ecosystem components, um, et cetera, biodiversity aspects, and the gene ontology for things like biological processes, functions, et cetera. So again, since they are really interoperable because they all follow this, they can mesh together and they're all orthogonal so that they're not, they're not uh, conflicting with different definitions. And we can engineer semantic layer for most of the applications that we need. If you need a new ontology and there's a gap in the Oval Foundry uh, coverage, it's quite, it's become much, much easier to set one up. Okay, with that, I'll close. And that's my uh, two cents in this conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pierre Luigi. That was very interesting. Next, we have Chris Mungle from Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Hi. I'm at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. I had the Molecular Ecosystems Biology Department there. And we actually make heavy use of some of the ontologies that you've heard about. Genome is used as, as a reference ontology for describing, um, you know, expression sites of genes and phenotypes of, of germplasm, uh, environmental conditions and so on. You know, we make use of ENVO for describing uh, microbial samples. Um, one of my main interests is in uh, functional annotation of genes across all species, and I'm actually part of the Gene Ontology Consortium. Um, and a lot of my work actually focuses on, on human and model organisms for humans, uh, for human disease. I'm part of a project called the Monarch Initiative that is aggregating genotype phenotype data and performing analyses over that, uh, making use of ontologies like the human phenotype ontology in order to elucidate uh, mechanisms of, of human disease. Um, but I thought for today, I'm actually going to talk about um, uh, a project that you, you heard referenced already called OBO, Open Bio Ontologies. Um, and if you move on to the next slide, uh, we'll give you an overview of um, the, the, the OBO project, the OBO Foundry and Library. So, um, so OBO was set up, um, we set it up, you know, um, probably about 15 years ago now. It arose out of both the gene ontology and a number of the, the early bio, biological ontologies, such as, such as the plant ontology. And the idea was to really create um, a suite of integrated reference ontologies um, that uh, follow a certain um, set of core principles. And, you know, the idea is there was a number of emerging ontologies, but there wasn't really any framework for these ontologies to be able to work together, to be, um, to, to be integrated together, and to also ensure that there was no unnecessary overlap between these different ontologies. So the basic idea is that the ontologies uh, conform to certain um, engineering principles. They're logically well found, founded. Um, they're, of course, scientifically accurate, and they represent the domain well. And apologies if there's any background noise here. This is actually maybe the worst five minutes <laughs> of the week here. Um, there's uh, some collection going on outside. 
uh, hopefully it'll end in a moment. But the ontologies are intended to be uh, interoperable and connected together, and what we sometimes call orthogonal. They should, as far as possible, avoid overlap. Um, and what we mean by overlap can sometimes be, be a more nuanced concept. So, um, for example, we have things like um, the, the crop ontologies, which are species-specific ontologies, um, which um, are, are dealing with the same domain, but each from the perspective of a, of a different individual species. And then we have things like the plantium ontologies that um, essentially bridge between them, which is absolutely fine in, in terms of the, the oboe orthogonality principle. Uh, but the, the idea is to avoid exact overlap as much as possible. And uh, you know some some other examples of these are the gene ontology. We've heard about some of these other ones. Uh, another crucial one is OBI for the ontology of uh, biomedical investigations for describing uh, experiments. And um, overall, we we came up with a set of about, of about ten or so evolving principles um, that um, ontologies should um, should adhere to. One of the one of the key ones is that the ontology should be open. Uh, you know, we're not really interested in, um, in in housing ontologies that have restricted licenses because this really limits your ability not only to use them as a reference ontology, but to use them as building blocks within other ontologies, which is really crucial within OBO. We're, we're really about building, providing a framework for building blocks that people can compose together ontologies themselves. Um, so I won't, I won't go into detail about um, all of these all of these principles. Um, and the way it works is there is a community, there's a mailing list, and I encourage anyone to, to join up. You can find out more on the site, which is linked below, obofoundry.org. And we, we have a number of different working groups. Um, there's, there's technical working groups that ensure all of the infrastructure works correctly, editorial working groups that um, you know, evaluate some of these ontologies, and outreach for you know, reaching out to communities such as uh, yourselves. So um, I struggled a little bit when trying to come up with some uh, some criteria for choosing a, a reference ontology, and really ultimately this this depends a lot on your your use case. There are many different ways in which um, you can use um, you can use an ontology for different purposes, and you know it's it's really helpful to get a, a you know a variety of different perspectives on this, both from you know your your own use case and others. So. Uh, you may just need an ontology just for simply annotating text, and in those cases, maybe you don't even need a full-blown ontology, or you don't need to necessarily use all of the features of an ontology. You're really interested primarily in the uh, the lexical aspects of it, but you may also be interested in uh, a reference ontology for annotating, you know, genes and variants and germplasms. And here, um, some of the the, the principles that, that um, Pierre Luigi described are are very important because uh, you know you want to make use of the graph structure of the ontology, uh, both to make your data more findable, but also in being able to do uh, various kinds of bioinformatics analyses on your data, such as gene set enrichment and so on. So here, the uh, the structure of the ontology is is very important. Um, and you know, other use cases include description of experiments or agronomic field studies and so on. So really, you know, the precise approach that you take depends on um, on your on your use case. And you know, there's a variety of automated systems you can use, such as ontology recommender systems and so on. But really, what I would actually recommend is you just reach out to um, to the ontology community, for example, on the Obo Discuss mailing list. Um, or other people in your in your field who are who are working with ontologies and just get a range of opinions and evaluate it from there. But also, you know, one of the goals of OBO is to make this easier because our goal is really to provide a set of these orthogonal interlinked ontologies, such that really there shouldn't be any overlaps, such that it should be clear for any one particular domain. You know, here, okay, I want to describe, uh, you know plant uh, anatomical structures. In that case, there's really only one ontology within all of Obo for doing this, and that's the, um, that's the plant ontology. Um, and so in these cases, it's clear, but there are, Obo is an evolving project, and you know, there's not always, we haven't necessarily always achieved orthogonality, so there is still discussion to be had in certain domains about, um, about how, how best to choose that um, ontology. 
And of course, I am biased here. I'm part of the OBO project, so I would advocate, you know, using an OBO ontology, but it may well be that the best ontology for a particular domain, you know, exists outside the, the OBO suite at the moment. Um, but, you know, I, I also kind of thought of what particular general principles from OBO to, to highlight. Um, you know, I, there's a number of technical and engineering principles I could stress, but really I thought maybe the, one of the best things to focus on was some of the, um, you know, the, the more social issues around ontologies. And I'd say really one of the key things to look at is does the ontology have some way for you to publicly and transparently interface with the community developing that ontology, such as a public issue tracker? And these days this is typically found um, on, on GitHub, and GitHub has really been transformative not only for software development but also for ontology development as well and in fact you can find on the oboe site uh, we have uh, links uh, for basically all active ontologies to their public tracker and um, and really I think it's the case that if if the ontology doesn't have a tracker then we've probably marked it as being an inactive ontology because really we, we emphasize this this aspect of, um, of of reaching out to your to your community. And you know, using this uh, this public tracker, you can also see how, how responsive ontologies are to to individual requests. You know, you want to you know work with um, you know a lively community that is, that is that is responsive here. And you can also see is the ontology already used for data annotation in your domain? Yeah. You know, so it this may seem seem obvious, but I think it's a it's an important criteria. It's you know you can for, you know there exist a number of ontologies that are have been developed. You know, according to some perfect ontological principles, but you know it's released and no one's actually using it for data annotation, um, and that really you know hinders its um, you know if it's not used in this way, then it's not going to be necessarily particularly responsive to to requests from that domain. So I'd say it's important to look for what has already um, been used out there, um, and I guess with that maybe we can we can turn it over to some further discussion. Thank you very much, Chris. It was great. Um, we're going to now introduce Alexandra Lafargue from Syngenta. Okay. So yeah. So um, I'm Alexandra Lafargue. So I'm based in uh, Toulouse. Uh, so I have been invited here, I think, to give a, a point of view, uh, maybe more on the private sector. Uh, and uh, I would like to to share with you some uh, challenges uh, rev um, we are encountering uh, now to use. Uh, the ontologies uh, at Syngenta and uh, also maybe what we would like to achieve around uh, ontologies. Uh, and uh, yeah, of course, I will share my uh, uh, ideas or my thoughts about uh, the different dim dimension that could make uh, an ontology uh, uh, as a, a reference for data annotation. Um, so I think. Um, uh, it has been shared by uh, uh, by, by the previous uh, presenter that uh, so outside of Syngenta, uh, reference data in the research community is uh, increasingly standardized to enhance the uh, findability, accessibility, interoperability. I think this has been already mentioned, and more and more companies understood uh, how much. Uh, the, the 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 re, 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 reusability of uh, data in uh, in science is uh, is crucial. So we uh, and and we know that research and development is really uh, more efficient and effective if uh, the relevant uh, and reliable information is uh, is uh, available at uh, one's fingertips. Um, so based on that. Uh, I would like to share some uh, um, some cha challenges we are we are facing uh, at at Syngenta. So you will see my examples will be more uh, seeds oriented. So if you uh, know Syngenta, we have uh, two parts uh, at Syngenta: the seeds part and the crop protection part. But I am more working on the seeds one. So today, I, I don't know if you. If you change slide because I don't see the the, the slide, yeah, okay, good. Uh, so so today we are able to answer a question like, what are the genes associated with 
a viral di d disease resistance trait for wheat crop. But uh, what we would like to answer, to be able to answer, is uh, give me all the QTL associated with uh, viral disease resistance trait for all the cereal crops. But uh, this requires an understanding of the concept that uh, compose this question and uh, all the different relationships uh, between uh, those concepts. So next slide. So what would we need uh, internally? We would need so a system that could search and link information in a way previously only people could do it, and uh, a system that could combine various sources of information in uh, the agriculture domain help to, uh, that would help to combine chemical data but also biological data uh, like for example weather data um, crop namings uh, equipment uh, chemicals active ingredients but also some information uh, from marketing like uh, prices or other other kind of data uh, and, and of course, we would need a system to infer data. So for example, uh, we could use all the no knowledge from one species in terms of pathways or gene networks or phenotypes uh, to explore uh, all uh, other species. Um, so it's uh, really um, es essential to share uh, a common understanding of the structure of information among people or software uh, to enable uh, the, the reuse of uh, do domain knowledge and uh, being able to separate uh, domain knowledge from uh, operational knowledge. Um, so it's, uh, I think we, uh, I already heard this, but really uh, it's essential to have uh, also a single uh, single source of, of truth uh, in, in the company. So if you go to the next slide, uh, we know that prob this is something that ontology uh, uh, could help and could, uh, could uh, bring to us. Uh, so this possibility to, to, un to answer more complex questions um, like uh, I don't know, for example, all the measurements for height of flowering from all data sets with, uh, with corn in a specific managed stress environment. Uh, and, uh, and then, as, a, as, a, as I mentioned earlier, this capacity to, to make inferences uh, and uh, hypothesis on other species uh, extending, to, extending uh, the, the, the corn crop to cereals, and uh, and also to to get more results uh, using synonyms like uh, flowering time uh, versus time of flowering versus um, antesis uh, based on this uh, eight of uh, flowering flowering traits and uh, and uh, yeah we we really need to add uh, more ontologies and uh, uh, additional um, external references. Uh, Syngenta is uh, not sufficiently uh, included in the wider community producing and governing the reference data as ontology. Uh, and uh, we really need to, uh, to, to include more for several reasons uh, to ensure that uh, reference data are relevant to our own needs. Uh, but also it would reduce uh, the reliance on uh, internal processes, uh, would reduce the cost of uh, integrating external data sets um, as uh, the vocabulary will be uh, uh, common or, or will have common reference model. So again, as Pankaj said, not reinvent the wheel. Um, and uh, yeah, one of our challenge today also is to break uh, the, the data existing data silos. Uh, so between uh, 
research and development, but uh, between also uh, uh, marketing, commercial, and production and, and supply. And um, today, those silos prevent to, uh, to find uh, the data easily. Uh, for example, uh, a researcher uh, would have to use a number of query tools or systems to uh, interrogate uh, uh, several databases. Um, and uh, that prevents also the silos to realize uh, good uh, data analysis. Um, yeah. So the the I would like also uh, to 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 share some uh, maybe so some solution or some ideas uh, to tackle this. Uh, so could be uh, so of course to establish uh, an ontology modeling skill uh, uh, for Syngenta and uh, and and again again. Uh, facilitate uh, the collaborations, uh, so to to provide uh, Syngenta input for requirements to co-create. I think we already uh, al we also uh, mentioned that co-creation around existing ontology. Uh, so um, according to me, uh, the maintenance of an ontology, so the the update, addition of new terms. Uh, evolution of an ontology is really uh, essential and uh, probably one of the main uh, quality criterion for for making uh, this uh, an ontology of, uh, re of reference. Um, and also um, um, facilitate collaboration um, to deliver uh, a working uh, data governance model uh, that uh, accommodates uh, industry contribution. Um, an ontology uh, designed by a community, uh, validated by this community, adopted by uh, industry, uh, make this ontology uh, also uh, considered as uh, an ontology of reference. Um, yeah, so for, for all, this uh, reason, I think, um, if we if we had the possibility to to use more uh, ontology, um, what I wanted to to have is a kind of uh, quality criteria for an ontology, um, and um, uh, so based on the the different criteria are uh, evoked. In, in the slide, so the, the uh, is, is that a community-driven ontology? Uh, does this ontology uh, uh, revised? Uh, what is the frequency of revision? Uh, does this ontology is adopted in the industry? Uh, yeah, so based, uh, yeah, uh, so something really uh, a kind of notation um, uh, to make uh, an ontology of uh, of reference. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Um, we're going to move on now. Uh, we have a little bit of time left for some questions or comments. OK, we have one here um, with Elizabeth. Yeah. Thank you for your uh, insight. I think it has been very useful to understand your perspective for having kind of uh, golden standards for selecting an ontology and describing in such a way that it's reusable and fair in a way. So we are talking a lot about fair data, but we need to talk about fair semantic resources. And I would like to, to ask you just briefly, if you, had to, if you had to cite three top ontology criteria you mentioned uh, that you feel are the most important to consider, uh, what, which one would you put up front? given that most of the time in agriculture we are in a hurry, we don't have much resources, so what would be the top three criteria you would suggest us to consider immediately? Thank you. So so that is a question for the panelists, Elizabeth? Yeah, for okay. if they want to so, answer anyone. So anyone from the panel, if you want to answer Elizabeth's question on your top three, would be your top three? Oh, this is Pankaj here. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Yeah, so the top three would be, uh, is it open? 
uh, are you planning to keep it uh, open and, and design it for a broader community, even though you are in a hurry? And the third one would be is uh, uh, how collaborative is that work uh, and applicable in terms of answering your biological questions? Those three are the top tier for me. So, so sorry, I, I don't know if I caught that you said open and collaborative. Open, collaborative, and long, long planning on long term maintenance of that. Long term mm -hmm. maintenance. Okay, great. Thank you, Pankaj. Do any of the other panelists have a reaction or a comment to that or have a different perspective? Um, so, Pierre, Pierre over here, and you know, I'd, I'd echo that, that, but I put the long term um, aspect first because if you have short pockets of time to develop something, it needs to add up to something in the end. You know, even if you have short, short increments, short bursts of activity, if it's maintained in something that has existing infrastructure, then it can add up to something quite significant over the years. There's that, of course, I, you know, I take openness for, for granted here because you can, interoperability in a closed environment is just, it, it, um, it will have impact for very large projects, of course, but it, it won't have global impact. So I take that as granted. Um, then I would also put in, it should be logically well-formed, that, uh, that criterion from the OBO principles, because otherwise you, you may as well use a vocabulary, which may be totally fine for your needs. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you want like, uh, to do sort of semantically driven research and ask more complex questions, if you're building an ontology, it should, they should, it should, be, it should be semantically well-formed, good logical axioms, and checked internally for, those, for consistency. Great. Thank you, Pierre Luigi. Do we have a, another comment or, or a response? I, I, I would really just echo what the other panelists said, have said there. Uh, you know, openness, you know, fit biological, fit biologically fit for purpose and collaborative, but also, you know, if you are in a hurry, you're going to need to be, probably make new, new term requests. So there should be a mechanism for either of those ontology developers to grant those quickly or for them to provide you with the tools that you need to be able to add those terms and for the, them to incorporate it back. Great. I also added the maintenance as the, the main criterion mm -hmm. and then collaborative and uh, how much it is adopted in the industry. Great. Thank you everyone um, for sharing that. We do have a question, I believe, from someone in the audience. Um, Eric? Yes, yeah, so I'm Eric Antesan. I'm, I'm working for Bayer Crop Science. Okay, so my, my question is, well, it was, first of all, very, very good presentation. Thanks for organizing this. I, I, I think we all heard about really good, best, good and best practices that are really nicely summarized. But, and I was curious to know uh, from the panelists their experience in terms of the common and or typical, let's say, traps, pitfalls that people or people that typically are starting in uh, in this kind of domain are, are falling. Where should people be more careful so that risk the risk of avoiding issues in the long run after let's say we started to build a platform or something like that are avoided? So I would be interested to know a little bit of their experience in this this kind of thing. Great, thank you, Eric. Do we have on an, one of the panelists that would like to respond? I I can I can take a response. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there's, I mean, I can think of many, I've seen many pitfalls and traps in, in developing ontologies, but with regards to the particular question today, I'd say maybe the most common pitfall I've seen is someone reviewing, say, the existing set of ontologies and saying, well, none of these quite fit exactly what I need to do, therefore I'm just going to roll my own because, hey, it's pretty easy to roll my own ontology, you know, I just need to, you know, get my terms together and put them in a hierarchy. But I'd say really, this is something that you, you want to avoid, first of all, because it turns out it's much more harder to maintain that initial set of terms that you're developing than you might at first think. And second, just just because existing ontologies may not fit your, you know, your use case precisely, um, it's using a lot of modern ontology engineering and development tools, it can actually be quite easy to either reuse an existing ontology and maybe extend it locally for some particular purpose, or really to just work with that ontology group to, to make it fit your domain. So, uh, you know, even though maybe everyone's in a hurry and they need, you know, something for their project today, it really does pay 
to you know um, do a little bit more upfront work and try and re reuse what is there already rather than rolling your own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I may, I'd like to pick up on that. So uh, up here, here. Um, so sometimes if if there is that need and you need it really quickly, what I've had uh, some users of Envo do is they 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 cook up a thesaurus or a vocabulary which is relatively simple to do. And they use it for their project and then queue that for incorporation into the ontology, which takes a bit later. And then we will work on it to pull those, those, those uh, concepts and terms into the ontology and then do the full semantic expression later. Um, we map back to the URIs or the, um, the identifiers that they used in their thesaurus so that then they can map their solution at a later date. If they ever pick that up, they can uh, map that back to an ontology, which has matured a little bit. And of course, we try to involve them in that process as much as possible. Yeah, uh, this is Pankaj here. Uh, I echo both Chris and Pierre's uh, comments and suggestions on, on that side. And and I agree that uh, you can start anywhere, but uh, one of the biggest pitfalls that we have seen uh, is many times people put the cart before in, in front of the horse kind of situation where uh, you start building ontologies first, but you don't know at the data. Uh, you anticipate that this kind of data would come. So always start with the data you want to annotate and learn what kind of things you are trying to annotate and the questions you are trying to answer. And then your ontology should be able to answer that question. If it's not, then there is a problem there. Uh, and, uh, and I can tell you, uh, uh, there are several instances even we think conventionally that this term belongs to that parent. But uh, but once you start building, going across, as we said, that some of the reference ontologies had started with a very broad uh, principle on uh, being species agnostic, then you immediately recognize how uh, species level ontologies are constrained by their structure. Because then, then you start, have to start amalgamation and refinement and uh, revisions on, on those ontologies. We have to be very, very careful on uh, on, on, on these things and, and you get very easily, very quickly uh, get sucked into that situation. Uh, and that is the biggest one we have always found is that uh, the concepts are changing as you're learning more about it, as you bring in more experts. So uh, it's, it's also an understanding, but it's also an evolving process. So term IDs for the annotation purposes, the term IDs that are, that are assigned to those uh, and hated objects it does not change, but their relationship in the ontology might change, and then that uh, the computing of that uh, uh, annotation and the and the answer uh, would would give you a would give you a different output. So that's where you have to be very careful about it. That's it. Great, thank you. We have um, one question from Marie Angelique, and then we have another one online from Andres afterwards. Marie Angelique, would you like to unmute and ask the question? So yeah, so I have a, a question. So in the agricultural domain, a lot of resources like document and data have been already annotated to Agrovoc. So since Agrovoc was not built uh, following the Obo Foundry principle, since the semantics like is like different, how can these annotated resources be integrated in search with like data that have been annotated with ontologies. I mean, Pierre touched a bit on, on that topic before, but yeah, can, can you be like a bit more specific? So, because that's, I think, something that is really important for this community, particularly at CGAR, where Agrovoc is widely used. Thank you. Great. Do we have anyone who would like to start with that? Um, yeah, so, since that was mentioned, I guess I, sh I should try. So, like, we, we do indeed try to look at existing standards. Um, in Envo, for example, on request, we've seen that some of the term on our request, some of the terms do have existing content in Agrovoc. So, what we would then do if the user requests it, we would um, go to Agrovoc, um, look at the definitions there, do a process of sort of semantic cleanup, if you will, clean up in the sense so that it will work with the axiomatization and the machines. And um, and then add it, add it to the ontology, or rather express it through the ontology, always mapping back to the source vocabulary. Um, again, we're not claiming to be the new standard, we're just offering an expression of layer for that existing standard. 
um, where possible or where needed, rather, depending on the resource. Uh, we'd like to set up memoranda of understanding with those vocabularies. We're doing this now with the marine vocabularies uh, and CMAX, um, so that they they agree to that to the fact that we will look at their vocabulary or thesauri um, and then express it in OWL and with a bit more semantic content. Then they have a chance to review it, say yes, this is correct, and we move on. That process usually takes a bit of time because it's often quite involved. There's lots of expert knowledge there, but it's better to start it. If there's a deadline, then of course we just sit there with a bunch of experts. Um, this happens with some of our earth science users um, and try to get the content they need in the ontology as quickly as possible in a kind of hackathon or a workshop or something like that, remotely or in person. Um, but the short answer is yes, we, you can do that. You try to map it, you add the synonyms as appropriate um, in, the, in the OWL, um, and then you map back to the original thesaurus of vocabulary. Um, that's, that's a short answer. Thank you. Were there any other panelists that wanted to comment on that? Yeah, I think that's a that's a great question, um, and you know it does it does highlight you know the you know the sort of ontology versus uh, thesaurus or vocabulary um, difference. But um, you know, I mean, I, the the first place to start is high quality mappings between you know your resource like Agrivoc and wherever the relevant ontologies are. Um, uh, Marie Angelique, who asked that question, is actually one of the experts in that that area. So, um, but yeah, yeah. Once you've got your your mappings, you can obviously transfer data across that's been annotated in one system to another. Um, but you know, maybe that's not completely satisfy, a satisfying answer. And really, what I would like to see happen, and this is maybe a very long term goal, is really just um, better better systems to allow you know. Um, <coughs> vocabularies like Agrivoc and GAX and so on to to be more to to be better part of the the, the ontology ecosystem and maybe that involves um, you know say the Agrivoc developers and the Obo developers working together on an agreed upon domain where we we really have one single reference source you can still compile down from an ontology into say a SCOS vocabulary if you want. Um, you know, I, I would definitely advocate for developing in a in a more robust engineering environment that makes use of OWL, and then compiling down to SCOS rather than developing SCOS in the first place. Um, but you know, that's not that's not something that's going to happen overnight. But it's um, it's you know, it's an area I'd like to see more work in. You know, I've done some preliminary work in doing things like axiomatizing Agrivoc, taking Taking it and trying to automatically kind of like figure out what the the, the underlying owl axioms would be and maybe how to structure parts of Agrivoc using existing OBO ontologies, but that's that's very much a research project at the moment. Um, so right now, you know, the reality is there are you know depending on your use case, you may want to use um, you know a SCOS vocabulary like Agrivoc. You may want to use OBO. You may need to use a mixture of the two and rely on mappings between the the two systems, um, which is, is is not ideal because you know mappings for many purposes um, you know, are flawed because they they don't necessarily rep represent true equivalence between the two two resources. Um, uh, but really, that's the that's the reality of the of the situation we have today, where we you know, you often end up having a mixed a mixed system. Great, thank you. I think we have two questions online now from Andres. Would you like to unmute and ask the questions or one of the questions to start, Andres? Sure, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Excellent, thank you. So I'll ask my second question first. Um, so the, uh, the idea of a high quality mapping was just mentioned and uh, this is a very common problem in the industry, um, in the in the operational aspect of the industry, where um, different uh, either input manufacturers or software manufacturers proprietary um, IDs for um, the same concept or similar concepts or related concepts um, need to be mapped, and uh, and such mappings need to be maintained. Uh, what what do you think constitutes a high quality mapping, and what what are the attributes of such a thing? 
So um, maybe I can I can answer that one since I, I brought up the high quality mapping issue. So um, yeah, I've maybe I've slightly more experience in this in domains such as human disease, which you know very much has has this issue where m many people have you know their own disease vocabularies. Some of them are proprietary, some of them are, are open. Um, so the two attributes I'd maybe highlight is the mapping should also include the semantics of the mapping, because very often you will download a set of mappings and it will turn out that the person who made the mappings, you know, really what they had in mind was, well, this concept is, you know, roughly somewhat equivalent to this concept. Um, and in some cases they may, you know, the mapping may actually mean, well, these two things are precisely equivalent. And for some purposes, that's fine. But for being able to use um, this in a system that makes use of, say, for example, owl reasoning, you need a more precise understanding of what those mappings are. So if the mappings also come with metadata such as, you know, this is an equivalence mapping, this is a broad, this is a narrow mapping, this is, you know, related, you know, maybe they also have kind of confidence or notes associated with them as well. And also, even though we all like to rely on automated methods, and there are some great automated methods, you know, some lexical, some making use of the graph structure of the ontology to to provide these mappings, really, they should always have been vetted by an expert because you can never rely entirely um, on names and labels and lexical elements to determine if two things are truly talking about the same thing. You really have to understand the domain and the um, and the source vocabularies or ontologies that are that are being mapped. But with my oboe hat on, I'd say actually it's actually better to try and avoid this problem in the first place by working prospectively to have a single sef single reference for any domain. But, you know, we live in the world we live in and often we have to deal with, with mappings. Great, thank you. And um, my other question had to do with, um, uh, again, uh, an operational industrial uh, scenario where um, there's uh, a series of, of emergent uh, vocabulary or, or other um, semantic resources um, uh, up and down that uh, that gradient that we saw earlier um, to, that are being made to help the uh, the industry interoperate and um, I've always uh, thought that it, it, although at this point in time most of of the operational industry players are not um, are not geared to working with ontologies, but are uh, thinking about controlled vocabularies and so forth. Um, the idea of, of being able to set things up inside an ontology and you know, provide this as controlled vocabularies and otherwise interoperate um, with uh, in the context of ontology is a very good idea. So what would a first step or a way to, um, to um, find the tip of the iceberg be for an industry group, like say Ag Gateway or AEF or, or, or somebody who owns a controlled vocabulary to find where it fits? How would we start? Um, right, so I think part of it is just making that commitment that you want to go up the semantic ladder and eventually build an ontology. Um, if you have it in the form of a control vocabulary that you control, um, what one would do would be, for example, to spin up an ontology with a clear statement saying, we're gonna develop this um, without too much semantics at the, at the early phase. That's totally fine. Um, you, can, you join a community like Obo, you get some consultation about just in, in a very broad level where to align your, your stuff. You know, are you talking about equipment? Are you talking about environments? Are you talking about biological processes? And then you just start putting terms in, lists of terms. Often then in the development of those other vocabularies that you would probably engage with or ontologies that you would engage with, they would see where those terms would fit more naturally and sort of move them around um, accordingly. Keep in mind, each one has their own uh, IRI or URI so you can all, your systems will always be able to refer to them as they're moved around into more appropriate places by a community who's a bit more experienced. Your internal people then can see how this is happening and learn through doing um, and then get fluent with it, while 
adding content to those ontologies. You can either do that directly as editors, or you can put in term requests to ontologies. But if you have a deadline, etc., perhaps it's best then to just create the content, link it to an ontology, create a memorandum of understanding that you will, um, the ontology will ingest that vocabulary as time goes by, and upgrade its content semantically. A little bit of this is uh, going on now with some of the work at Biodiversity and CGIR. Uh, Marie Angelique also um, worked on this project as well as others there, uh, this agro, the agronomy ontology. Um, it, it kind of spun up some content from ENVO for environments like agricultural plots, et cetera, but then said, look, what's missing is agricultural equipment and the methodology. So they just found the place to plug into in this ontology framework to start creating equipment categories and using OBI, the protocols and the uh, processes used to execute things like fertilization of fields, et cetera. And they start adding content and eventually that will be upgraded. So I think, you know, the you know, there is done early, early uh, synchronizing with that semantic layer. It's totally fine if it can't go that high so quickly, but at least the, the rules and things start moving and other people are looking at your content to help you um, advance it. Great. I'm, I'm looking at the time and, and I'm seeing that there's lots of really great questions and unfortunately we will have to wrap up because we are at the end of our time. And so we are obviously the, the ontologist community of practice. Um, there's different working groups and the different aspects and ways to be involved. We're currently trying to refresh uh, our mailing list and better engage with all of you. Um, so following this webinar, you will receive a note and it will ask a few questions just to kind of understand your needs and how you want to participate. Um, and then finally, Finally, next month we'll be holding another webinar. Uh, it'll be on machine learning and ontology. And another special thank you for Elizabeth for organizing this and, and for the team for putting this together, Michelle um, as well, and Celine. Uh, we thank you all for being online and uh, we look forward to the next webinar. Bye.